Welcome to another session with Dr. Me. Today we will be discussing cardiac biomarkers. Coming to our case scenario, we have a 41 year old male patient with a past medical history of recurrent chest pains now complaining with chest pain acute in onset associated with shortness of breath that began the prior evening while playing softball. At the time, his symptoms were also associated with nausea and vomiting. So the patient attributed this combination of symptoms to an acid reflex. However, an ECG which was done at a local hospital showed STT changes and he was brought to our hospital for further evaluation. On admission, his ECG showed ST depression and T inversion in anterior leads of V1 to V4. Hence, a troponin was sent and troponin was 0.03 at admission and 0.36 hours later. So, what is the importance of cardiac biomarkers? Most of the time, when a patient presents with an acute chest pain, it is very difficult for us to understand whether it is a cardiac or a non-cardiac cause. So, in order to understand further regarding the etiology of chest pain, we have the novel use of cardiac biomarkers. What do you understand by cardiac biomarkers? These are substances that are released into the bloodstream whenever the heart muscle or the heart tissue is damaged or stressed. Measurements of the biomarkers are especially useful in the diagnosis of acute coronary syndrome and cardiac ischemia and also conditions that are associated with insufficient blood flow to the heart. Now we have got basically three types of injury that can happen to the heart. One is the myocardial ischemia, next is the myocardial necrosis and also something called as a hemodynamic stress markers. Coming to myocardial ischemia, we have got the ischemia, we have got the ischemia modified albumin and also the heart type fatty acid binding protein. Now myocardial necrosis that means there is an ischemia and a reversible irreversible ischemia has occurred leading to myocardial cell death and necrosis. That we have the troponins, CKMB and myoglobin. Hemodynamic stress markers that is these markers are released due to either pressure overload or volume overload to the ventricles especially seen in heart failure is the natriuretic peptides. We have the BNP and ANP. So coming to the algorithm in case of how the cardiobiomarkers are formed. Usually whenever there is an endothelial damage, the endothelial damage is usually caused by reactive oxygen species LDLC and oxidized LDLC and also inflammatory damage. In case of inflammation, we have the elevated inflammatory markers like CRP, IL-6, IL-8, IL-10, 12 and 18. Also, tumor necrosis factor alpha, small uh, SD40L, interferon gamma and homocysteine. So, these are inflammatory markers which are associated with an acute MI. So, whenever you get a patient with acute MI, if the CRP or the IL-6 or TNF alpha is elevated, do not worry. It is not due to the infection, but the acute myocardial infarction itself can cause an elevated level of inflammatory markers. Now coming to the plaque formation. Once the plaque forms and it destabilizes, that is when, whenever the plaque destabilizes or only you will get the that is associated thrombosis and there may be embolism. So whenever there is a plaque destabilization, there is release of cytokines and adiponectins and pregnancy associated protein A. Okay. And after the plaque destabilizes, there is going to be embolism or occlusion of the coronary arteries which can lead to myocardial ischemia. This myocardial ischemia will lead to release of IMA, high heart type fatty acid binding protein, brain atriotic peptide and HSP. Okay, so these are the conditions when whenever there is a myocardial ischemia that occurs, these, these elements are released from the cardiac muscle tissues. Okay, once the cardiac necrosis occurs, that is there is irreversible cell death occurs, what happens? You have the cardiac troponins, CKMB, heart fatty acid, heart type fatty acid binding proteins and myoglobulins. So this is what we use for diagnosis of 
Acute MI. Now, acute myocardial infarction. Okay, now we have got the myocardial stretch markers, like I said, in case of either a hemodynamic stress in the form of a volume overload or a pressure overload. We have got the nephritic peptides, we have the BNPs and the ANPs and the NT pro BNP, and also adrenomedulin that is ADM. In case of heart failure, apart from the BNP and NT pro BNP, we also have the CAM that is cell addition molecule. So, what we usually use is the pro-BNP and NT-BNP. CAM and soluble CD40 ligands are the newer markers that are being used for myocardial ischemia. Okay, what is the importance of cardiac biomarkers? Something that you need to understand is whenever a patient presents with chest pain, either it can be an anginal chest pain or a non-anginal chest pain, that is an atypical cardiac pain. Usually, we take an ECG. If the ECG is normal, absolutely normal, but the patient has got a known history of cardiac disease, you may term it as chronic angina or an unstable angina, provided your cardiac biomarkers are normal. Your ECG is normal, your cardiac biomarkers are normal, you term it as chronic stable angina or very rarely unstable angina. Now, you have ECG changes. So, the ECG changes are not typically relevant with an acute ST segment elevation or you know it does not actually follow the arterial territory. You have got maybe ST depressions or T inversions that is not consistent with an acute myocardial infarction. In such cases comes into the play your cardiac biomarkers. If your cardiac biomarkers are elevated in such a situation, it should ideally be taken as NSTEMI or non-ST segment elevation myocardial infarction where the STT changes are not consistent with an acute MI or do not follow an arterial territory or does not have any ST segment elevation as expected in acute myocardial infarction but the troponins are positive. Then we have the ST segment elevation MI where you have a typical ST segment elevation that is consistent with your cardiac arterial territories and also the troponins are going to be elevated. So whenever you have a chest pain in order to identify whether it is a cardiac cause, whether the patient needs to be thrombolyzed, whether the patient needs to go a primary PCI, it will be dependent on the troponins unless you have very typical ECG suggestive of arterial territory involvement. So, what do you understand by cardiac biomarker? What do you understand by the ideal cardiac biomarker? So, the ideal cardiac biomarker should be in high concentration in the myocardium, should not be anywhere else. It should be in high concentration inside the heart or the cardiac myocardium. And it should not be present anywhere else. It should be absent from the non myocardial tissues. It should be able to rapidly release into the plasma or into the blood once there is a myocardial injury. And we should always be able to relate, correlate between the extent of injury in the myocardium and the level of increase in the cardiac biomarker. And we should be able to measure it rapidly and also using simple automated method because if you, you have to use a very complicated method where it takes 24 hours, we, we may lose the window period to thrombolyze the patient. So, it is very important that we have a rapid diagnostic assay for an ideal cardiac biomarker and even small minute quantity should be, be able to should we should be able to pick up even small minute quantities of the cardiac biomarker present and also we should be able to diagnose late MIs that is these cardiac biomarkers should be in the circulation for a prolonged duration at least five to seven days suppose a patient had an acute episode of angina or a chest pain five to six days back and they're coming to your ER or into your OPD after five days because the pain has worsened or they just want to know what was it, that event and if you could do a cardiac biomarker and it is positive you would have actually diagnosed the patient at the right time and even would have avoided a future complication also so hence it is important that these cardiac biomarkers persist in the circulation for a minimum period of you know five to ten days to provide a late diagnostic time window for a patient who arrives late after the event Okay, so as discussed earlier, we have the inflammatory process because initial period it is actually there may be an initial inflammation just like any other tissue. There is going to be plaque destabilization and inflammation. So the initial cardiac biomarkers include CRPs, interleukins, tumor necrosis factor, CD40 soluble, CD40 ligand, 
and lactic metalloproteases and myeloperoxidase. However, we usually do not assay, do not test for the inflammatory markers routinely because it is too early in the disease and most of the time it may be inconsistent for a diagnosis. But what we actually test is the acute injury markers, biocardial ischemia markers and necrosis markers that is a troponins, the CKMB and heart rate fatty acid binding protein and the cardiac stress markers like I already said these are the BNP, the pro-BNP and the adrenomedullin and the atrial natriuretic peptides. Coming to troponins. Now troponins are the cardio biomarker of choice currently and it has eclipsed all other markers like CKMB, myoglobulin when it comes to the diagnosis of MI. So, troponins are basically structural proteins in the cardiac myocytes and in skeletal muscle. Basically, we have got three types of cardiac troponins. We have the cardiac troponin T. T is which is bound to tropomyosin. Okay, this is cardiac troponin T. This is bound to tropomyosin. Then we have I or the inhibitory troponin which is bound to actin. This is I. So, this is bound to the actin complexes. This is the tropomyosin. Then we have C, which is bound to calcium. So, basically, this helps in the contraction and relaxation of the cardiac muscles. Okay. The, it helps in the formation of the actin tropomyosin complex. Okay. Actin tropomyosin complex. So, that actin myosin complex in the formation of the bridge theory. Okay. So, what is troponins uh, imply in an acute myocardial injury. So, these are mainly protein bound and with a very small amount as you can see in the picture we have very small amount of troponins which are not tissue bound. 90% of the troponins and are in the myocardium which is bound to the protein bound bound to the tropomyosin actin and calcium. We have around 10% around which are the cytosolic troponins which are free okay which are not protein bound. So whenever an acute MI occurs whenever an acute MI occurs there is release of the troponins there is release of the troponins from the cardiac tissue. So there is going to be a biphasic increase. Why is there a biphasic increase? Because there is going to be release of the troponins which is the cytosolic troponins are going to be released but it is a small amount it is going to be a small amount and a minimal release okay later on what happens there is going to be a gradual release there is going to be a gradual and a sustained release of the myocardial troponins okay there is going to be a gradual and sustained release of the myocardial troponins and please note these are very high specific highly specific and highly sensitive markers of acute myocardial infarction hence the esc criteria or the aha criteria for the diagnosis of mi actually includes the first criteria is there is going to be an elevation in the troponin levels above the 99th percentile as along with symptoms and signs of myocardial ischemia so troponin positivity is essential for the diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction usually they appear two to four hours after an acute myocardial infarction they remain elevated seven to ten days they remain elevated seven to ten days of my after the occurrence of an acute mi okay seven to ten days so whenever a patient is coming with chest pain so sometimes it may be too early because they may be coming uh, around after maybe within 30 minutes one hour or two hours and when you check the troponins they may be normal or you know maybe you know low normal level so it is highly important unless a patient have a st segment elevation mi so if the patient has got an st segment elevation mi patient is coming with th within 30 minutes or one hour and you have an ect which is a classical st segment elevation following arterial territories please do not wait for troponins you can immediately go in for thrombolysis or a primary pci for the patient troponins are insignificant at that point but if the patient is coming to you 30 minutes or one hour you see ecg changes that are you know not specific you have a bit of a t inversion or you have st segment depression you need to send your troponins if the troponins come back negative or low normal but you highly suspect that the patient has got a chest pain that is of cardiac origin you 
you need to repeat your troponin after 6 hours. Similarly, what we did with our case because the initial troponin was low normal 0 0.03 and later when we repeated after 6 hours, the troponins have risen and it has come down to 0 0.3. So, it is essential that you repeat the troponins if you feel that the initial troponin was too early to be diagnosed and it is usually seen in case of also seen in case of acute or chronic heart failure, aortic dissection, chronic kidney disease, myocarditis, tachyoshubo cardiomyopathy, atrial fibrillation and stroke. Okay, coming to the next cardiac biomarker that is the creatine kinase. We need to understand that there are three main isoenzymes with two polypeptide chains that is where we have the, got the B polypeptide chain and the M polypeptide chain. So skeletal muscle we have mainly MM polypeptide 98% of the CK is MM and only 2% is MB. Okay, so usually whenever CK can be elevated in case of muscle disease but it will be mainly CKMM. However, in cardiac muscle, 70 to 80 percent is CKMM and 20 to 30 percent is CKMB. So, something that you need to understand is that cardiac muscle has got the highest amount of CKMB. Okay, then it is only CKBB and in plasma also it is mainly CKMM. So, CKMB is very specific for heart disease. That is why we are using it as a biomarker. Coming to the details. Now, the important thing of CKMB is that it appears in blood within 4 to 6 hours. 4 to 6 hours after an acute myocardial infarction. It will peak by 12 to 24 hours and usually return to normal within 48 to 72 hours. Okay, by third day, it is going to be absolutely normal. So, that is the advantage. Suppose a patient has got an acute MI, you have diagnosed MI, your troponins are going to be positive. But the patient has got a re, you know, a post MI infarct, post MI angina or a recurrent angina on day 5 or 6, that is good, that is patient has got another clot on day 5 or 6, your troponins are still going to be elevated because they are going to be persistently high from till day 7 or till day 10. But then comes the advantage of having CKMB. Why? CKMB would have risen and normalized by day 3. So, the patient has got an anginal attack when while being treated for MI on day 5. You can do a CKMB and actually look for reinfarction in such cases. So, the main important thing of CKMB or diagnostic you know benefit of CKMB in the current scenario is for the diagnosis of reinfarction and also early diagnosis of MI. Please note that relative index. So, sometimes the patient has got a skeletal injury or, or a muscle injury and you see that the total CK is also raised and the CKMB is also raised. So, you need to understand whether it is due to a skeletal injury or muscle injury or due to suppose a patient has got coexisting rhabdomyolysis or something like that. You need to understand whether the CK is coming from the muscles or from the cardiac tissue. For that, we have the relative index. The relative index is where the CKMB mass is divided by the CK into 100. So, less than 3 is suggestive of skeletal muscle injury and more than 5 is indicative of MI. Please note that the relative index is only valid when both the CK and CKMB is elevated equally. Okay. Another thing we need to understand is CKMB has got again two isoforms that is CKMB1 and CKMB2. Okay, CKMB2 is the one which is released from the cardiac muscles. So, usually you have in normally in blood you have the CKMB1 form. CKMB1 form which is normally seen in blood but whenever there is an acute MI, CKMB2 will be more seen. Okay, so that is about creatine kinase. Coming to myoglobulin. Myoglobulin is an oxygen binding protein, okay, of the cardiac and the skeletal muscles. It is a sensitive index of myocardial damage and something you need to understand it is, is the first one that is going to rise whenever there is going to be an acute myocardial injury. It can rise within 1 to 2 hours and it will peak within 12 hours and by 24 hours normally it comes down to a normal level, okay. And it is also seen in skeletal muscles also and muscle diseases, acute renal failure and acute myocardial injury infarction. The role of myoglobulin is very much limited in the current scenario. Coming to LDH. LDH is not currently being used 
for the diagnosis of MI. I brought in the topic because I have seen some previous questions with respect to uh, lactic dehydrogenase uh, for the pg and exam. So, something that you need to understand is LDH has got 5 isoenzymes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 of which you need to understand that LDH1 is expressed in the heart, mainly expressed in the heart and the ratio of LDH1 to other isoenzyme is the one that can detect an acute myocardial infarction. But like I said, LDH is not very specific for acute myocardial infarction. Usually it increases within 6 to 12 hours after the onset, peak at 2 days, usually by 100 hours and returns to normal within 8 to 14 days. Up to 2 weeks it may be elevated. But the advantage is that it it will help you from distinguish from acute to subacute MI in patients with positive troponins while CK and CKMB are negative. Okay. So, an LDH 1 to 2 ratio more than 1 is very specific. Like I said, the ratio is more important than the titers of LDH 1. So, this is going to be the curve that you need to be thorough with. The first, the first biocardic myobacter which will come into the plasma is myoglobulin please understand myoglobulin this is myoglobulin so myoglobulin will come into the blood within one to two hours one to two hours it will peak within 12 hours and usually return to normal within within two days that is 24 to 48 hours usually it becomes normal okay next is the ck ck of which please note it is ckmb and of ckmb it is ckmb2 which will get released within 2 hours, 2 to 3 hours. Okay, it will peak by 24 hours and become normal, become normal by 72 hours. Okay, 3 days. By 3 days, it will be normal. This is CKMD. Okay, then we have the LDH. The LDH, like I said, it is slow. It is very slow. It will start developing within 1 to 2 hours, but it will only peak within 3 to 4 days and it will remain the longest up to 14 days. The most sensitive marker and the cardiac biomarker of choice is the trop I and trop T of which it will peak within 3 to 4 hours. Okay, it will start within 3 to 4 hours, peak by 12 hours and remain 7 to 10 days. So, troponins are the choice for diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction, CKMB for reinfarction. So, like I said, the time of initial evaluation Troponin I, it will take at least 4 to 6 hours. Myoglobulin, but like I said, 1 to 2 hours, you can detect it. Time of peak for CKMB is 12 hours. 10 hours for myoglobulin. Troponin I is also for 12 hours. Myoglobulin usually return within 22 to 48 hours. CKMB, 3 to 4 days. And troponin I is 3 to 10 days. Hence, you can use this for reinfarction. Okay. Now, a few a few sentences on brain nitrogen okay b type natriuretic peptide so it is synthesized and released by the cardiac ventricular cells okay in response to volume or pressure overload whenever there is a volume overload or a pressure overload because there is going to be hemodynamic stress onto the walls of the cardiac myocytes they release the b type bnp peptide active bnp and inactive anti pro bnp are generated from the cleavage of pro BNP. So we have got pro BNP which is actively cleaved and you get the active BNP and the inactive anti pro BNP. It is secreted into the bloodstream at equal concentration and also we have got it atrial natriuretic peptide. It is stored as preform in the intracellular granules and BNP is predominantly synthesized when triggered by extracellular stimuli. So the ANP is already in a stored form. Okay, so it is not going to elevate beyond a certain point. Okay, but BNP is synthesized in response to an extracellular stimuli. Hence, BNP is a more sensitive marker for an acute heart failure or a chronic heart failure than AMP. Okay, now what does it do? It actually binds to the NP receptors, natriuretic peptide receptors and it will activate the intracellular CGNP signaling cascade and it will try to reduce the afterload and preload and also it produces intense vasodilatation. It will produces intense arterial vasodilatation thus it will produce uh, preload and afterload reduction. Okay, usually it is seen in this typical marker for heart failure, systolic and diastolic dysfunction, left ventricular hypertrophy, valvular heart disease also very rarely in acute ischemia. 
these are actually degraded by uh, pro bnp and ant or, or nt pro bnp are filtered by the kidney and they are degraded by the neutral endopeptidases okay now coming to emerging biomarkers like i said for acute myocardial infarction il6 and crp are going to be elevated most of the time in the emergency department <laughs> you get consultations from the cardiologist saying the patient crp is very much elevated and they are suspecting an infection but please be aware that the crps are going to be elevated in case of an acute myocardial injury also so don't worry when you see an elevated crp it is not always an infection in case of an acute myocardial infarction then another thing that is coming up is a soluble cd40 ligand okay now the recent studies have shown and associated that is uh, the level of cd40 ligand and the prognostic importance of mi okay that is the severity and the mortality and morbidity association has been seen with the increase in the level of soluble cd40 ligand galactin 3 is seen in heart failure then cardiac myosin binding protein seen in mi and also h heart type fatty acid binding protein acute mi so these are the emerging biomarkers so you may get questions from them that also so coming to the mcqs so mcq number one troponin T is preferable to CPK MB in the diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction in all of the following situation except bedside diagnosis of MI postoperatively after CEBG, reinfarction after four days, and small infarcts. Actually, the uh, the answer is C. Thing I've been stressing it enough. Like I said, CPK MB returns to normal within two to three days. Hence, a reinfarction after four days can be detected only by CKMB and troponins remain elevated for 7 to 10 days. MCQ 2 troponin T is a marker of myocardial infarction. Creatine kinase is elevated in MI after 4 to 8 hours. 4 to 8 hours. MCQ 4 BNP is degraded by neutral endopeptidases. MCQ5, the predominant isoenzyme of LDH in cardiac muscle is LDH1. Okay, I think it is very clear, very simple questions. Dokumik.